Okay, welcome to the Gear Scout Podcast, where we talk tactical and all things that go bang. My name is Christian Lowe, and with me, as always, is my ballistic brother, Chris Cleary. Hello, Chris. Oh, ballis- ballistic brother, I like that one. Stick with this. That's a good one. I like that. I'm, I'm gonna. Work. It's going to be a new one each week. We have a great show for you this week. We're going to talk about military camo. You're going to love this because I got a real bone to pick with some of these decisions. Uh, Chris is going to talk about how much he loves Glocks. That's Glocks with a G. Uh, I'm talking about a little bit about 300 blackout, shotgun reloading, and a few other things that you're going to want to know about. So stay tuned till the end of the show. But first, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Loa. You know, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Loa and, and know that they're a top European bootmaker for the serious alp- alpinist and hunter. I mean, these are like extreme conditions that call for high-end engineering, right? These guys make no-joke footwear that'll, you know, summit Everest and stuff like that. Well, they've taken that cutting-edge design and applied it to the tactical world. With its latest boot, the Inox Pro GTX TF, they take the perfor- that kind of performance to the next level for the tactical professional like you or the wannabe you like me and Chris. You know, we need comfort, support, and durability across a wide range of missions and matches and range days and all that kind of stuff. So if you're like kicking indoors or want to be kicking indoors, these are great shoes. I have a pair of those uh, Inox Pro GTX uh, TF ones. They're sort of a a mid-height boot um, and they work great. I'm going to be testing those out pretty soon, but the ones I've been running are sort of the low top version. I've been running those like every single time I go to the range or do a match or something like that. And I love them They're They've got a little bit of Gore-Tex on them. You know, they work through the mud and the, and the, and the, and the wet and moisture and all that kind of stuff. You and I, Chris have done some, some, some matches and stuff where there's, you know, dew and it's wet and we have to run through stuff and those things uh, perform really great. So we're really happy to have Loa as a sponsor right now and uh, hope that the listeners will definitely take a look and and check out their footwear for for all their operational needs so let's get going here chris uh talk to me what's been going on with you in your life there's a lot of movement uh uh in your professional world for sure so uh there is a lot of movement in my professional world uh, got to actually have my first meeting with the team yesterday, and it was very exciting. Uh, got to meet uh, all the new guys I'm going to be working with at the Pentagon, and one of the most exciting things that happened to me, I was a little, I was a little, I was pinching myself uh, to be a knucklehead sitting at the table and having a two-star admiral sitting behind me uh, at the back bench, not having a seat at the table. I want to say that's probably the first time in my life uh, that's ever happened. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to get over to the Pentagon and to start my new gig. You're going to get all kinds of power hungry? You know, I'm trying to stay away from that. Uh, you know, I am going to get uh, executive dining room privileges. I've heard it, I've heard the executive Whoa, dining room. Oh, very fancy. Yeah. So, uh, so for any of you knuckleheads that are listening to this show, um, if you see me in the Navy wing and drop, you know, Gear Scout under your breath, I will weasel you into the executive conference. We got, we got to teach him the secret handshake, Chris. This will be, uh, you know, what stays in Fight Club, you know. Yeah, that's right. You know, no, there is no Fight Club. But if you uh, secret handshake me and say Gear Scout, I'll know you're on the inside. That's right. That's right. You got to start. Stuff and I'll hook you up. What, 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 next time I see you, I got to hand you a, a, a stack of uh, Gear Scout podcast uh, business cards so you can kind of toss those around the, the E-ring there. Yeah, when I get my coin made up, uh, you know, hey, anybody, anybody who says Gear Scout to me in the E-ring gets a free uh, chief information security officer of the Department of the Navy coin. That's amazing. Uh, if, look, if anybody ever comes up to me and says Gear Scout, I'm going to freak out. Uh, are, are you going to have an got, AR-15 on that coin? An AR-15 and a Glock? You know what? I'm going to have to do – I'm going to – you know, that's a great idea because probably what I'm going to do – you know, maybe if we even take his design suggestions, it's going to have to be hidden. That would be the great inside joke. So so if we could make a if I could make a coin with a little inside joke in it that gives a head nod to shooting sports, uh, even though I'm a cyber nerd, uh, I will do that. So uh, I'm 
there, actually, there's an office in the Pentagon that will design and help you make coins because guys do this all the time. Right. Uh, so now I'm going to have to get creative. Now I'm going to figure out how to hide something like that in there. Aren't there always like sort of Greek words on there or something? What's the Greek word for pew, pew, pew? It might be pew, pew, pew. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a direct translation. Now, the exactly. letters might look different. The Greek letters might look different. It might not read that way, but it, it's probably spoken that way. Right, so, yeah, right. And that is the translation. Throw, throw a hidden Mulan Labe in there or something, you know? Is that how you say it, Mulan? I, I guess. I don't know. I'm not Mulan. Greek. Yeah, we're not Greek. Co um, come and take it or something, you know, in the background. Yeah, come and take my ones and zeros. That would be, you know... That would be the cyber play on that. Well, that sounds pretty exciting, dude. I mean, I'm 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 psyched to come visit you in the Pentagon. It's been a long time since I've uh, stomped those uh, grounds, and um, you know, I, I've I've been in there quite a bit, and I remember it was always very confusing to me. I, I would always have to build in a little extra time for meetings because I can't understand. Like you, as a sailor, can probably understand those signs on the walls of the Pentagon yeah, that like, yeah. kind of give you directions. You know, it reminds me of like being on an aircraft carrier. There was like this sort of Byzantine code on these little signs yep. to tell you where how to get to where you were going. And the only way I could ever find any offices that I ever had to go to was by knowing where the exhibits were in the Pentagon, right? Like, so there's like a NATO exhibit. There's a, yep. a, a hall that has all the portraits of the, the defense secretaries and the chairman of the joint chiefs and all that kind of stuff. And so I would always have to find my way there. And then I would know which direction to go kind of thing. Otherwise I was screwed and I had to build in uh, tons of time uh, to, to find meetings. And, and sometimes what's crazy about that place is at least, I mean, it's been a long time since I've been there, but at least when I was there, you know, back in the day, there was all kinds of dead ends. Like there were some, some halls that don't go all the way around the Pentagon that like, oh shit, you realize like, I got to like backtrack, go around, go another hallway. Or uh, again, I've never worked in the Pentagon. So this is going to be my first, my first foray of actually working there. But for years they were doing construction, mostly pre and post September 11th. Cause you know, Pre-September 11th, they had just redone the, the Navy Command Center, and a lot of those things were brand new. Right, right. Post-September post 11th, there was all kinds of construction. There's always construction going on. But you would find me walking around a, a corridor, to your point exactly, you'd hit a dead end, and you'd have to go up or down a level to keep going around the ring, or you'd have to go out a ring or in a ring. Um, people that work there and have worked there their whole lives, I imagine, have some crazy stories about that building. Yeah, yeah, my, my favorite story about it, and I'm not sure it still exists, someone who's listening to this might want to comment to, to make sure, and you'll find out soon. I love telling the story about the little like gazebo in the middle of the courtyard at the Pentagon that used to at least sell like sandwiches and lunch sure stuff, does. and they called it the Ground Zero Cafe because yep. they knew that Soviet uh, intercontinental ballistic missile warheads were targeted right on that cafe in the yep. middle of the courtyard at the Pentagon. And it still does sell coffee and hot dogs. It's still there? Okay, yeah, good. Well, well, that's good to know. Last time I was there, you know, six months ago, it's still there. You know, it's still a vestige of the Cold War, just like last week when we were talking about uh, Red Dawn, you know, like uh, it, it reminds me of, you know, the, the, the bad slash good old days. For me, you know, personally, I've been doing some prep for our big shoot coming up next weekend or the, in a couple weekends. Um, you know, I have been doing a little bit of practice, some dry fire. We'll talk a little bit about that later on in the episode. Um, mainly, uh, you know, I'm sort of getting things spooled up for the Association of the U.S. Army uh, annual show slash meeting uh, coming up in a couple weeks. Um, you know, as many of you know, I work at Military Times newspaper, and which includes Army Times, and we do a big uh, push on that show. We're sort of the official show newspaper. We got lots of friends who work at uh, the Association of the U.S. Army, lots of alumni who've worked at the paper that work there. And uh, so we have a full court press um, with both our defense news team and the Army Times team. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of coverage. We're going to be doing a lot of gear scout coverage. We're going to be doing some video stuff, you know, just like we did at Modern Day Marine. I hope to meet up with you there uh, so that we can get some 
some inside scoop on some new gear that's there um, and uh, bring it to the listeners and uh, to the to the audience and stuff at Gear Scout on our website and the social channels and YouTube and that sort of thing. So I've been um, kind of, we just had a big planning meeting today and so we're all getting prepared for uh, that deal. Yeah, I, I can't wait. I'm hoping to get there, so like you were saying, get there on Monday. Uh, you know, as a Navy guy, I love crawling around the Army stuff. Uh, God knows I love messing with that gear, so I plan to get there at least one of the days. Yeah, I mean, you know, the interesting thing is, I mean, you know, the, the Army, obviously everyone knows this, but but maybe some don't. I mean, the Army really does drive a lot of the procurement decisions in, in the other services. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they have the budgets to do the larger programs. So people like the Marines and that sort of thing, they they tend to piggyback on a lot of these big Army programs like the M17 and M18 handgun, you know, this, the, the Sig Sauer modular handgun. Yep. Um, and they're also uh, tied very closely to the Next Generation Squad Weapon Program. Uh, so, you know, a lot. And then that, that's sort of what we concentrate on in the Gear Scout side. But, of course, the Defense News and Army Times, they're looking at the bigger systems, you know, the missiles, the you know, armored vehicles and that sort of thing. So um, it, it's good for someone in the Navy. And, and the cyber is a big part of it these days. I mean, so you I know, kick it's funny. Yeah. I noticed at Modern Day Marine, there was a lot more boxes with plugs in it than guns with bullets and stuff there. So, you know, so to that note, that is the next battleground, right? So even at AUSA a couple of years ago, they started it with a cyber pavilion. Um, and it was a very small, they had a couple small tables there. And every year the cyber pavilion's gotten a little bit bigger, a little bit more attention. Um, it's my uh, guess, I'm kind of foreseeing into the future here a little bit, but in a couple years, you're going to see the cyber pavilion begin to demonstrate no kidding, bona fide, non-kinetic weapon systems. Yeah. Uh, you're going to see that. It is coming. The cyber, the cyber pavilion's not just going to be about cyber security and a few interesting tech companies that are starting up to help do, you know, whatever in that space, you're going to begin to see purpose-built non-kinetic cyber weapon systems uh, in the not too distant future. Yeah. So I, I'm it, very it, excited it, about that. That and the, and the, the, you know, the, the drone and surveillance and all that yeah. kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. The, what we're going to talk about, though, in the news segment here, it's sort of a, a sharp pivot is, um, you know, something that's a lot less uh, electronic. It's so <laughs> much more analog. You know, this is a, uh, a, a, a topic that I'm extremely passionate about and that uh, I've done a lot of reporting on uh, over my you know 20 year career uh, uh, covering the military. And that is. As of September 30th, so the end of the 2019 fiscal year, the Army no longer uh, wears, has any soldiers or should have any soldiers wearing the universal camouflage pattern. This was the sort of loaded green slash gray uh, pixelated slash digital camouflage pattern that they developed back in sort of the 2005 time frame. This was piggybacking on the Marine Corps' efforts um, when they changed their camo pattern around. I may have these dates a little bit off, but, but around the 2003 time frame with yep, the, the quote, right. MARPAT, end quote, yep. that sort of uh, green, brown, black, um, pixelated pattern camouflage that was really kind of pivoting off of the Canadian... CADPAT, um, and then the Army wanted to get on, on the bandwagon and develop their own, quote, digital camouflage, and they developed this sort of camouflage pattern that they claimed was, was universal uh, to all environments, and it ended up being jack shit for every environment kind of deal. And um, it turns out, you know, the Army switched its camo pattern uh, to a, a version of what, what most consumers and most people on this podcast know of as, um, as uh, multicam, developed by Cry Precision. Um, there's, there's a lot, you, we could go deeper down that wormhole into, into really knowing what 
the pattern the Army's wearing now derives from, but it's essentially an analog camo pattern, right? It's, it's squiggly, you know, browns and, and, and dark browns and greens and tans and that kind of thing. Um, you know, and it just, it's a, it's a topic that drives me nuts because the Army spent, I don't know if it's billions with an S, but they had to have gotten up there in the spending on this pattern that was a piece of shit. And um, it didn't, it was within three years they were starting to investigate a new pattern because of, interestingly, uh, a, a, an old congressman from Pennsylvania, John Murtha, who'd been talking to some crusty old, you know, <laughs> sergeant first class or something, uh, or first sergeant somewhere um, in, in Afghanistan or Iraq who said, this camo we're wearing sucks. And this other one that the that the snake eaters are wearing is a hell of a lot better. And he pushed it into Congress, and he got the army, forced the army to start uh, uh, examining it. And um, you know, there, I did a lot of reporting on this in the past, and it, when, when this program was going through, and they came around and adopted a version of multicam. It actually turns out to be a version of multicam that Cry Precision developed for the army as part of the Future Force Warrior um, program back in the day. I think it's called Predator uh, officially, um, but it looks an awful lot like multicam. And uh, so we know that now as uh, the, uh, the OCP, occupa or, uh, uh, Occupational or Overseas Camouflage Pattern or something like that. So Overseas. Let, me, let me chime in here for just yeah. a minute. Because the, the thing that's driving me crazy I'm going back to, you know, my beginning days in the military, again, in the Navy, but every once in a while, you know, even Navy guys get issued the battle dress uniform and we had the woodland pattern, and the desert pattern, and everybody wore the same BDU. Not only can I not keep up with the patterns, I can't keep up what we're calling them because the Army combat uniform, the ACU, which apparently is the, what you said, the, unif the, 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 the universal UC camouflage pattern, UCP. But but do they still call their uniform the Army Combat Uniform? The ACU, like the Pretty Navy. Pretty sure they do. Because I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on exactly the fact that the Navy's the Army's getting rid of the 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 what would be the ACU or that UCP pattern, right around almost exactly in sync with the Navy getting rid of the blueberry or the Navy working uniform type one, with being piggybacked by the Navy uniform type two and the Navy working uniform type three, type two being a woodland pattern that looks very similar to the Marpat and the type three being a desert pattern, which looks like the desert Marpat. Now, I actually think the Navy from a coolness factor got it right. Uh, I think with all the digitized cami patterns, you got the Air Force one with that crazy tiger stripe digital pattern that just looks ridiculous. They, we um, call we call in Afghanistan we called it the tactical aloha shirt. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it right? really is now, bad. Now the blueberries, I'm gonna say that I liked them. It was a horrible uniform. Oh, they're terrible. They're terrible. But the Navy adopted a battle dress uniform style uniform, which I enjoyed wearing. I will tell a dirty little secret. In 2008, when I was at Cyber Command. I was one of the first people in DC to wear that uniform because I wanted to, even when it wasn't technically allowed, I just said I was doing dirty work. So as a Lieutenant commander, a commander, um, and it, it, it picked up very quick, you know, Hey, all the other services wear a battle dress uniform around right. the Pentagon or in the building. So I started as soon as I could, I did. And I enjoyed wearing it because it was easier than wearing khakis. Sure. Um, the joke that they always made about the Navy guys, it's like, oh, if you fall into the water, nobody can see you. But I said, well, hey, if you're an Army guy and you get shot in the chest and you're lying in a grass field, nobody can see you either. Yeah, I mean, so, that, that, that's sort of a good point. I mean, the, the, the Navy argued that the blue uh, was consistent with working on a ship and dealing with, now I could be wrong, but dealing with paint. Grease and, and sort paint, of thing. you're just getting dirty and stuff, yeah. 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 I mean, look, we always wore dark colors at sea because before we had the, the, the Navy working uniform, um, there was a period of time that we just wore blue coveralls. Yeah, coveralls. Which, which I admit was my favorite uniform yeah. to wear at sea. The coveral yeah. at sea 
was perfect. It was easy to put on. Right. You jumped out of your rack. You pulled up one zipper. Right. You could get it dirty. You threw it in the laundry. You didn't have to press it. I, I think the coverall at sea, and even when we put our little collar devices and our, right. you know, the, the, the enlisted had white lettering. The officers and chiefs had gold lettering. It right. looked decent. You could, you could, you could make it look presentable. Um, and again, it was it was comfortable. It was easy to wear. The submarine community still wears yes. coveralls at sea yep. because it's just an easy thing to deal with. Laundry, uh, you know, you can have three or four of them in a sea bag. It takes up no space. It's awesome. Um, I'm a fan of the Navy getting rid of the blueberry, but they are. But what I do like most about them getting rid of the blueberry, the Navy is still staying with a battle dress type uniform. Right. So when I deployed to Iraq, of course, you weren't going to wear the blueberries in Iraq. We were issued the old um, desert pattern camis to wear over there, which were great, super comfortable. I love the desert, the the traditional desert pattern cami. I, I like that. I like wearing that uniform a lot. They're, they're, they're called the three color desert a, a, yes. as opposed to the what, what are colloquially known as the chocolate chip desert right that was the sort Correct. of operation desert storm Correct, version yeah. and then the three color desert were the ones that you saw seals wearing uh in um afghanistan and stuff in the in the 2001 2002 time frame and you know what's going to be cool about all of this and you, you bring up the seals and the and the huya units i've already seen stories how certain huya units are going back to the old pattern because now it looks retro and cool so I've seen other special units going back to the traditional, what would be desert camouflage. I think somebody was even wearing the traditional woodland camouflage. Yeah, the, I, I know Marine special operators have been sort of, have adopted that sort of uh, retro um, uh, woodland pattern, which is what it's, it's called. Uh, exactly. I, I think the, what, from what I've heard, they uh, like that pattern because it matches more with their Afghan commando partners that are sure, using that right. pattern um, or using a pattern similar much. to that. Um, you, you need to, one of the things, clearly you're making a distinction between the uniform and the pattern that the uniform has, right? Like, so I'm tracking, right. you liked having more of a uh, combat uniform uh, to wear uh, uh, when, you're, when you're going to work, right? Um, and, and I'm a big fan of the Army's development of that uniform, the, the ergonomics of the pants, the pockets, yep. the adoption of the shoulder pockets, the, you know, the angle. Um, there are some people that criticize the Velcro on the pockets and stuff because it can be noisy or, you know, when it's wet, the Velcro doesn't really stick that well. The Brits stick with, uh, you know, a button uh, configuration because of quiet and security and all that kind of stuff. You know, one of the best uniforms I thought, and I, I, forget, I forget the precise acronym and name, but the Air Force had a great, I remember meeting a JTAC over in Afghanistan who had like a new style uh, Air Force uniform, um, and it was sporty, man. That thing was badass. Um, and you know, so I'm with you on that, on the cut, the style, the actual configuration of the uniform. But the pattern, the blueberry pattern, was terrible. The UCP was terrible. You know, interestingly. Some people might not know this. This is, this is why you want to listen to this podcast. That's right. I'm going to drop some knowledge for some people. But the AOR1 and AOR2 are, your, are, are the original names for the pattern that your Navy, new Navy uniforms are in, which is the Navy working, Navy working yeah. type 1 and type – or type 2 and type 3. Uh, those were developed by N Naval Special Warfare Command, right? Uh, really, SEAL Team 6 was looking into these patterns. Uh, the desert pattern was, I think, AOR1, and that was developed along kind of the lines of the, of the desert MARPAT, the marine pattern. And the AOR2 uh, is more of a kind of a jungle uh, pattern. It's got brighter green in it and all that stuff. I geek out on this big time. I could spend probably an hour... Like I'm a total fanboy of of look look this up, listeners. This guy Guy Kramer from Hyperstealth, he is the guy that really took, a fr he calls it fractal geometry camouflage, and and really blew this out in the markets. He's a Canadian. He started with the CAD Pat, um, uh, worked with the Marine Corps to develop the Mar Pat. Um, he was involved in the Army's um, uh, search for a new pattern. 
it did not get adopted. Uh, there's many, you know, you could talk to my great friend, go to soldiersystems.net sometime and talk to him, you know, look at the articles that my great friend Eric Graves has written about this. But the Army has a penchant for wanting to keep the patent, so to speak, on things so that they're not paying a licensing fee to uh, companies uh, for ammunition, guns, camouflage patterns, any number of things. And so that's and, part of the reason why they developed that uh, OCP. And I know we're going to move on. And the last thing I would just say is a guy who was of one of the four or five services who have the Coast Guard that we've all gone through this game. I wish we would do one thing. At least agree on a cut of a uniform. We could all argue with our own special patterns, but I think if this military at least agreed on a cut would save us money across the services, whether it be the traditional BDU style yeah, point. or the ACU style. And can we agree on one pair of boots? There's got to be it's so annoying. 15 pairs of boots. Yeah. Look, at, can we at least just get together and agree on one pair? Because even the Navy with the blueberry had those stupid black felt no shine boots. Yeah. You had then a desert boot. The Air Force must have three different green boots that they wear, which are fucking ridiculous. The Marine Corps has their one boot, you know, that they wear. And what, the Army's got to have at least two boots. It just Can we agree on a boot? Yeah. And I mean, and, and remember, you know, you can always check out our sponsor, LOA, and see yeah. what <laughs> options they have that are, that are mil-spec, right? So that's a great segue, Chris. Thank you for yes. that. You're welcome. Let's agree on a boot. All right. I love right. shoes, but I also love guns and stuff like that. You know, we're it's that time in the show where we talk about, you know, the, the gear and stuff that we're kind of eyeballing, that we got to hide under the rug, you know, because we'll get in trouble from, uh, you know, sink home on this kind of stuff. Um, I got to admit, Chris, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm having a hard time right now. I'm struggling I, I'm, I'm struggling and I and I may I may need to sit down lay back on the couch and and have my uh, number one shooting buddy kind of knock some sense into my head but I saw a movie this weekend with my wife and there, there was of course you know any time that I, I can I can maneuver into watching a movie that has some shooting in there uh, I, I do it and and I I there was a badass woman, you know, running some badass kind of AR style rifle. And I was like, man, that thing is unrealistically quiet. Like what the hell is going on here? And then I thought, you know what? That could be a 300 blackout running subsonic. That would totally make sense in this context. And I thought to myself, you know what? I do not have one of those in my inventory. And that is like the perfect home defense gun, like close in kind of shit, like super quiet. You put a seven and a half inch barrel or five, even a five and a half inch barrel with a can on the end, you run subsonic, you get that thing. Like that's kind of the ultimate close in deal. And so I'm sort of thinking to myself, like, do I need to start investigating options on this, Chris? Am I, am I crazy? Should I, I mean, you know, last year for Christmas, I bought myself my, scorpion uh you know evo uh pistol you know cz scorpion pistol you know and like got a can running on the end of that thing it's a nine mil it's kind of cool but then i'm thinking you know what they're in a blackout it's pretty awesome and if you're running it subsonic with a can it basically sounds like a staple gun when you shoot that thing <laughs> i mean talk to me veer me pull me back from this ledge chris so uh, I can't. I might have to lead you to the ledge. That's the you thing. Over. You can't. Right. I, I can't pull you away from the sledge. Um, my only argument against it, and I'm going to get into this when I start talking about my gun, which you could probably talk me off the ledge on. Uh, look at 300 blackout. Who doesn't want one? I don't have one. I want one desperately. I've been thinking about buying a 300 blackout upper for the AR pistol that you helped me build couple of years ago and I got that 10 and a half inch upper on it. Um, my look at the 300 blackout round. I hope I was hoping would be less expensive. And I go back to my zombie apocalypse scenario, right? Five, five, six, nine Good millimeter, point. 12 gauge. That's the stuff that's going to be around 300 blackouts. An awesome round home defense, 30 caliber round. 
you know, a short package like that, nobody's going to argue that is not probably one of the better takedown bullets you can have. Um, it is absolutely on my short list, what you are talking about. And I actually opened up the link you put in our prep. I'm looking at the SIG MCX Rattler pistol carbine right this minute. It's fucking awesome. It is. Now, now, th th now th this is the struggle I'm having. Hiding this, hiding something like that under the rug, maybe not possible. So yeah. what do I do? Do I like build one? Do I? Well, look at building a 300 blackout is easy, right? I that that's the other option because I've already built an AR pistol. All I got to do is buy a uh, you know a, right. a five inch 300 blackout upper, and now yep. I've got an AR pistol with 300 blackout. So you could go back and forth, and um, yeah, man, I it, it's absolutely on my short list. The yeah. can is on my short list. You have a little better, easier access. I keep saying this every time we talk. Every day I don't get one is every day I got to wait longer and I'm not yeah, making yeah, up. Yeah, 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 for a can. Yeah. You, you, you absolutely yeah. have to get a can. And, you know, it, it brings up, uh, we talked about this in the last episode, my visit to Q. You know, they make the Honey Badger, which, uh, you know, we talked about this the last time, but, but you know, was developed for Dev Group um, to replace uh, the old MP5s uh, that were breaking down. And that's where the 300 Blackout came from. That's where, um, you know, we, you know, they, they wanted to make sort of an, uh, the AR ergonomics and that sort of thing uh, with a 300 blackout. But I didn't know this until I went to Q and I love Q and I love the Honey Badger. But the thing about the Honey Badger is it, it, because it's so short, because it has a shortened buffer tube, taking it apart and putting it back together is problematic. The, the spring extends into the upper. It's hard to explain unless, I, you know, I should have shot a video of this, but, but those who, who may have seen one of these, or if you go to SHOT Show or get a chance to look at one, have someone walk you through taking it down, it's not easy. Um, shortening it, shortening that, that stock and the buffer tube uh, and spring and buffer kind of thing is, yeah, yes, but it's it a be, little bit wonky. But it's got to be similar because I know you shoot an, an MCX carbine, which it doesn't have a buffer tube. The spring is right because it's a right, it's a right, piston right, gun right above the bolt carrier group. The, the sig the sig is a piston gun, right? So it doesn't need a buffer tube and spring and buffer. Um, the the honey badger is still a gas gun. Well, but I have a sig I have a piston. Um, add core defense right. carbine that absolutely has a buffer tube in it, and it's a piston gun. It, it, it I, I've never taken it apart, but I, I, it, uh, you, uh, you've got, you've got a, you probably never cleaned it either. No, I don't, I don't, I mean, no, but my, my <laughs> SIG, I've never cleaned any of my guns, but, but my SIG MCX, it has no stock on it. I mean, it has no, a that, stock. No, that's what I mean. It's, it's the, the, the spring. I've seen it, I've seen them pulled apart. The bolt carrier group Has sort of like spring. rides below the spring, and it, it's not behind it. It's almost right. on top of it. Right, right, right. Um. But a, a traditional piston gun, you can have a folding stock. It doesn't – you don't need the buffer and spring and tube for that bolt and carrier kind of deal. I don't know. For the – yeah, for the MCX, but I know what you're talking. Okay. Yeah. All right, so listen, so I'm going to transition to my want. Yeah, I want to hear this. Talk, and you can talk me off the ledge in the other way. Now, in, in, the, in the, the prep for the show today, so last year when I bought my Glock 19X, I bought it apparently between Labor Day and, and Veterans Day because Glock does a really good uh, deal for veterans. If you have a DD-214 and you go to a, a participating gun store that's, a Glock dealer, you can buy a Glock handgun at the, what do they call it? The, um, the blue. That's uh, right. Yeah. The, the, the blue mil LE discount. Yes. So, and they'll give anybody with a DD two fourteen that mill law enforcement discount, um, which is a good deal. That's how I got my Glock 19. So I was stumbling across the website and I realized that it's, we're between those dates. Now you, when you first got your hand on the Glock 43 X, and the Glock, what's the Glock 48? Um, I wasn't crazy about the color scheme, but I definitely liked the idea yeah. of 
uh, the the single stack thinner gun. Yep. Well, then they came up with the Glock 43X, which was sort of the principle behind the 19X. They just made a little longer. Right. Uh, it's like a full frame handle, 10 round magazine. Um, and then, then they made it in all black. And I'm like, oh, I can kind of get behind this because I didn't like the silver slide on the other one. Well, with that and the combination of the fact that now you can get the, the law enforcement military deal, um, I'm now intrigued. So uh, there's a gun store literally two miles from my house. They're part of, they're a Glock dealer. They, they are part of this program. That's where I bought my 19X. I'm seriously looking to go see if they've got 43Xs in stock in black because that might be my next thing. But this is going against one of my tenets. You and I don't know if we've talked about this on the show before, but one of my principles, again, zombie shoot, zombie apocalypse. Uh, I have a wife. I have four kids. They range between the ages of 12 and now 19. And when the zombies do come, I didn't want to be messing with different magazines. So when my 12-year-old ah. needs to reload and she's got one of my Glocks and I have many, I can just throw her any Glock magazine. Right. It's going to work. Well, when I, when, now when I introduce this gun to the kit, well, now I'm going to have a different magazine. Not that that's a big deal. I'll still get it in 9 millimeter. Right. You hate me for owning the Chris Vector, but it's the same reason I bought the Chris Vector because it took Glock magazines. So you get the 30 round magazines. I could throw that in a pistol. Right. I can throw that 30 round magazine into any end of this yes. Chris. And it's just one magazine that hits all of my pistol caliber things, one magazine. Okay. This goes against the grain. I've never, but look, I've never been into concealed carry. I would like to one day. But the, you know, if you're going to concealed carry, this would be the gun that I would carry with me. Okay. And the reason why Chris isn't into concealed carry necessarily, he is into it. Uh, we both live in the state of Maryland, which right yes. now is a May issue state. Uh, so you have to have a, quote, good and substantial reason to have a concealed carry handgun. And it's extremely difficult in this state, although... There are some court cases in front of actually the Supreme Court right now to that may influence that. Uh, that said, Chris, a as a friend, <laughs> I am going to tell you that you are 100% spot on. You need to get the black 43X. I agree oh, okay. with you 100%. I think that I'm not into the silver slide. I just went ahead and bought it because I thought that as a potential concealed carry handgun for me, it fit my hand right. I shoot Glocks well. I'm into it. There's a little sliver part of me. Now, there's a ton of great concealed carry handguns out there. I'm sure we'll get some folks commenting that like they like one thing or the other. I'm a little regretful that I didn't wait until I got my hands on a and really shot a lot of a of a Sig P365. That is a pretty great, uh, you know, compact. Um, subcompact really uh, concealed carry handgun that said uh, I think the 43x in black is the way to go since you don't already have a 43x uh, an original one uh, with the silver slide and let me just give you a little bit of um, logic uh, to to help you with this decision when the shit goes down it's not going to be your freaking concealed carry handgun that you're going to be toting around that thing will be in a drawer somewhere in your back pocket just in case you're going to be running your main you know uh yeah. 19x or something like that that'll accommodate all the magazines you need that 43x is 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 not useful uh in any kind of you know a uh, prolonged self-defense scenario that is a carry gun 100 percent for it's like carrying a fire extinguisher you know yeah, uh, yeah. You, I agree. you hope you'll never have to use it but because of the size of the frame, the slim frame, you know, the 10 plus one magazine, you know, all of that, uh, it, it really is uh, an amazing, great option. You know, check out uh, Gear Scout YouTube uh, and you'll see a, a review I did of the standard USA Atlas uh, appendix inside the waistband holster. They had just released one for the 43X um, and you'll see, you know, me doing some draws and all that kind of stuff. You know, for my body style and that kind of thing, that 43X is totally awesome. Uh, I love it. Um, you know, and I think waiting 
and getting it in the black so it's all you know the same color I, I thought you know it's fine look it's a concealed carry handgun it's gonna be in a holster under your shirt 99.999 percent of the time uh, unless you take it to the range um, so I didn't really care about the color that much, but, but I get it uh, with the consistency. Um, I do agree with you on, and there's been a lot of criticism uh, online and comments and forums and stuff like that about how it doesn't fit other Glock magazines and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you have like 90 Glocks, so <laughs> you can outfit your entire family with a gun per hip. Uh, and and not have any problems uh, with magazines and 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 sidearms and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so. and I'm just going to say one more thing. Again, I am a Glock fanboy, uh, and again, people will beat me up, but uh, I got to tip my hat to Glock. The fact that I don't even see the silver slide one on their website anymore, so I think everybody hated the silver slide gun, and I don't even know if they sell it, but. As far as colors go, I just the genius of them coming up with the Glock 19X and the Glock 45, which is just the black version of the 19X. Genius, guys, genius. Because somebody's going to buy the Glock 45 who want who doesn't like the Desert Tan or the FDE, which I think is super cool. I love I love the 19X. Yeah, particularly with the extended magazines. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I'd be lying to you if I said, if I ever had throwaway cash, uh, that I wouldn't buy a Glock 45. I'm lying to you to say I wouldn't do that. I know. It, you you it would 100% into my do my collection. That. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get it. Um, I just, what I don't like, and I love Glock. They're great friends. I have some friends that work there. You know, I, I but I agree with some of the, the internet comments on this stuff that, like, naming, like, naming having a new name for a gun just because of the color is sort of <laughs> dumb. I mean, yep. that kind of pisses me off, you know? Yep. And I give my friends at Glock shit about that all the time, and they roll their eyes and go, I get it. Um, marketing. You know. It's marketing genius, though. I got to tip my hat to them. It's marketing genius. They'll I, figure it out. You and I can quibble about that over beers uh, at some yep. point. I don't know that it's marketing genius. I think it's kind of lazy. But speaking of – Lazy, yep. not being lazy about training up for our match coming up. And and really, I mean, look, guys, we talk about this match, and, and I was thinking about this the other day. Like, we got this thing coming up, and for us, it's a big deal. It's really fun. And I know there's probably some folks that are listening. They're, like, rolling their eyes going, oh, these guys are just talking about this one thing. We're sort of using it as a, as a metaphor for a lot of, of, of training and skills and tools and practical things that – that we, you know, we like to do to try and get better. And, you know, as the year goes forward, uh, we'll continue to do some training. We'll, you know, Chris and I, you know, Chris will be a little busier, so we'll have to kind of narrow it down to weekend shoots and stuff like that. But, you know, we'll, we'll be constantly doing two gun, three gun competitions, IDPA, USPSA, all that kind of stuff. But one of my weak points when it comes to three gun, and I think that is true with a lot of people, is the shotgun. Look, the shotgun's easy to shoot. You know, you get a good high cheek present, you know, high cheek, uh, you know, um, kind of index uh, and, and, and know what your pattern's going to do. You should always pattern your shotgun so you know uh, where to aim and all that kind of stuff. You're going to hit what you're aiming at, right? The huge problem that everyone knows is the reloading. And so I've been trying really hard to come up with new techniques uh, and new ways to reload so that uh, A, I'm faster, obviously, and B, uh, that I'm not spilling shells all over the place. So one of the things I finally did is I bit the bullet. You know, I, I'm, I'm a dummy for not doing it uh, uh, sooner, but I went ahead and I bought some training shotgun rounds, right? Some inert 12-gauge shells, right? They're just plastic. They have a brass... Um, um, you know, sort of end to them and stuff. Uh, so they're, they'll, they'll take a beating, you know, with the bolt and, and in the magazine and all that kind of stuff. But I've been working, I've actually been kind of doing some YouTube foo and looking at some <laughs> folks and seeing how they, uh, what their reloading techniques are and all that kind of stuff. And I've been working really hard down in my garage on a timer, uh, trying to, I've been experimenting with both you know, the two shell hold and, and the four shell hold, right? 
where you load two and you've got four in your hand and then you load the next two kind of thing, like really trying to get the flat palm to get them in there. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago I was training and, 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 I, and I timed myself and I got like four shells in there in like 17 seconds, or maybe six shells in like 17 seconds. I mean, that is like an eternity. That's terrible. I switched my technique a little bit and I was able to kind of cut that time in half. But still, that's seven seconds, um, and, and under stress and in a match, I'm not sure that I wouldn't be fumbling around. Um, but I've been trying really hard to get faster on this, and I'm having a hard time, Chris. I, one of the things that's really, it's almost like um, when you anticipate recoil uh, on things, I'm anticipating really jamming my thumb in that uh, yes, gate. because that hurts. And it hurts like a fucker, man. And... You know, you're doing that over, you know, 10 or 12 stages or something like that. And like you are beat to shit and, the, and you sort of un, or subconsciously avoid really pressing that thumb in there. Um, I'm having a hard time. Well, I'll tell you what, what, what burns you on the shotgun reload is if you get lazy and you don't get the shell all the way with the spring. Right. And then it come, you don't get it all the way in and there. Then it and it pops comes back, back out. out. It, it, you know, that's or that's what screws you over there. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Again, talking about the zombie match, you know, day one pistol rifle. It's all about the pistol. You know, your pistol accuracy is, I think, where you, is what makes or breaks you on each of the stages. Day two pistol shotgun. I think it's all about reloading the shotgun. That time reloading the shotgun is what is making and breaking people on the stage. Right. Um there was a kid there. Remember in the stage we shot last year, he was a younger kid. He was a SWAT officer for like a local town. Really nice, really, really nice kid. Really, yeah, he was using a know. goddamn reloader on his butt stock and he That's was using right. a pump gun. He was using a pump gun and every free second he had, he was jamming another round. So he, and he might one at a time. Two or, yeah, one at a time. And he crushed us all. Um, that, and then he would keep spare strips of, of shells in his pocket on a Velcro strip and he'd slap them on with Velcro on his gun. He'd go through it. He'd take that Velcro strip off. He'd throw it on the ground. He'd reach in his pocket. He'd throw another six or eight rounds that were then on the side of his shotgun were his ready rounds. And when he, what, when he was transitioning from target to target, he jammed two or three in real quick, engage his targets. Again, he was using a Remington 870 five round, you know, Five plus one. Right. We were using Mossberg 930 JM Pros nine plus ones. Right. And he was crushing us. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to yeah. do what he did. I'm not going to do it. I, I, all I'm saying is this kid, that kid was, he knew what he was doing. And I imagine I could see him in the stack on his local SWAT team. And yeah. I imagine the shotgun was his gun. That's what he was in the stack with, and that kid could run that gun. You know, that's the thing is like, you know, the Jam Pro is almost a crutch, right, with that nine-round yep. magazine because you're, you're constantly – I know I do it. When I go up to a shotgun stage, I'm counting the number of rounds, and I'm thinking yep. how many reloads am I going to have to do here, right? And maybe that mental kind of calculation is – taking bandwidth away from concentrating on the actual reloads and all that kind of stuff. Look, I, I'm just going to keep practicing it. Like I have a pretty good shell carrier on, you know, that I can attach to my gun belt and all that kind of stuff. I've, I've worked on it a little bit, you know, I, I'm going to need one of the things I'm really going to have to think a lot about Chris is, is, you know, particularly if I'm like open bolt, you know, like that kind of screws you if you load, uh, into the magazine, it, you know, particularly if you pop one out, it can get stuck. I mean, I do not have a stage saver. I'm thinking about that, but like, I don't think I'll be able to get one in time. So yeah, I'm in the exact same boat. You know, and I think I think you raise a good point with that guy that was in our squad last year. It really is about when you're transitioning from one part of the stage to the other, like taking as you're walking being able to reload that shotgun and just make sure that you're topped up. When we were doing the shotgun in the shoot house day two, when you got to the shoot house, you know, 
because there was only four or five targets in each room you went into. You know, my whole thing was you could go to one side of the shoot house, clear all the targets. And as you were walking to go to the other side of the hallway, boom, you were jamming rounds in. You jam at least, you know, so if, if you had not, if you had 10 rounds in the gun, I think you go into the first side, there was one, two, three, maybe four, four or five targets you engage, maybe six. And then as you start running to the other side, boom, you're jamming at least four because, you know, you, the, the bolts close, you can get into the, the loading chamber, you can get three yeah. or four more in there. Yeah. You gauge some targets, you came back out, and then I think it was another pistol. Oh, then you had to shoot that steel target at the end of the hallway. Remember yeah. you came in, that was a flapper. Um, yeah, well, listen, the, the, the training that I've been doing, I know we've been talking mostly about uh, dry fire training. So I'm not going to bore anybody with the dry fire training again because uh, I've learned my lesson. I'm still a fan of it. I'm still going to do it. I'm On your airsoft gun, did you did you you don't like uh, that airsoft gun anymore? I don't know. I still have it. I was going to return it. I missed the 30 day thing. I'm going to call them, and they're going to get me to get it to run better. Um, that said, uh, doing some YouTube studying. You know, everybody likes to you know YouTube training, um, and I came across the bill drill. The bill drill. I it's forget what that is. So it's actually a really simple drill. It's only 15 rounds. And what you do is it, it, it's called the guy Bill who did it, but it builds on itself. So on the clock, you know, buzzer, one round, um, shooting an at EPA target or eight inch circle from, I don't know, maybe four or five meters, relatively close, you know, draw, shoot. Then it's draw two, shoot two rounds, draw, shoot three rounds, draw, shoot four rounds, draw, shoot five rounds. And I guess the principle of, of the course of fire is, um, at least what they were saying, I don't believe this because I don't think I've ever really trained that way. But apparently, you know, hey, when you're at a target, you fire a round, you want to see where it went. So the idea was, you know, you've got your sight picture, you, file, you fire a round. And then you take your eyes off your sights because you want to see where the bullet is. You want to see if you hit your target. And what this is trying to teach you to say, all right, you're going to shoot one round. Look where you went. Now you're going to shoot two rounds. You're not going to, you're not going to reassess every time you pull the trigger of where your round went. You're going to fire two rounds. See, and then you'll look where your rounds went. <clears throat> and, you know, then you build. Then you shoot three. Then you shoot four. Then you shoot five. I think for the guys that do IDPA, that do the three gun, that do the shooting like you and I do, you know, you're conditioned from the beginning to put at least two targets in every round. I'm sorry, two rounds in every target because that you're scoring the target that way. So, you know, you get into IDPA or USPS, and I think the drill's more designed for people who just go to the range and are trying to hit what's in front of them as opposed to the things that we're doing. So I get the idea of the build drill, although I would think for the kinds of shooting that you and I are doing, it's not it's not going to improve our skills so <clears throat> i guess i'm saying I'm, i found it i thought it was interesting yeah I, I don't i'm gonna say i'm probably not a fan of that drill but if you were a basic novice shooter trying to build speed and accuracy it's not a bad drill i look i think I, that's one of the things i have got to concentrate on is speed and accuracy speed coupled with accuracy right like i'm perfectly accurate when, when I slow down, but you know, one of the things I need to do is learn to shoot fire two rounds at every target rather than one. Right. So, mm -hmm. and have those rounds be very, very close. Um, I am not super good at, 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 at fast multiple shots that are accurate, right? I'll throw one and then I'll get one in there or I'll throw the first one in and then I'll throw the, I'll, I'll get the first one accurate and I'll throw the, the second one a little bit. So, you know, I, I think that any of these drills, I think helps any shooter in some way, right? Um, yep. And so particularly when we're dealing with the kind of shooting sports that we're doing, uh, speed really counts. You know, USPSA is a little different than IDPA because of the scoring, right? You get, you know, IDPA changed the rules so that you're more penalized by inaccuracy uh, than you are in USPSA. So you, I, I think I've got that right. Well, you're and not so limited by, have, by magazine capacity either in USPSA. You can always run high capacity magazine. Well, yeah, I mean, at least in IDPA, you can run 
you can't run a high you can't run a higher than 10 round capacity magazine in your first magazine but you can definitely run higher capacity magazines after that right in idpa yeah i've yeah. only thought it was you could only run your 10 round magazine in each well then i've been strength. then i've been uh, breaking the rules <laughs> every match <laughs> That would that says a lot because that I yeah different. because I I run you know division capacity and the first you know as the buzzer goes off and then any reload reloads I have I've got 15 rounders look any of those drills will help with marksmanship some of them help with you know uh, consistency over multiple shots some of them help with just pure accuracy and all that kind of stuff one of the things I like to do is inject a little movement into some of these drills. You know, I have a hard time, uh, you know, I'm not doing a great job of, of moving my eyes, then my gun to the target, um, and also reloading on the move and stuff like that. And speaking of moving, unfortunately, we've kind of reached the end of the show, bud. I know we, we could keep talking yes, for another have. hour, but I think, uh, you know, our, our listeners might get a little bummed out because their commutes are running out. Um, so I just want to make sure that we, you know, and uh, on a good note, um, you know, look, we, we're, we're excited that everyone's here. Um, that, you know, as always, look, please click subscribe and, re and leave a review on your favorite podcast app. Uh, we are now live and full on on Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play. iTunes is still messing with us a little bit, but by the time you listen to this episode, we should be there. Uh, make sure to visit Gear Scout on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and the web for lots more info, video, and pics. Another thing I want to give a shout out, one of my, I mean, again, I'm going to get a lot of criticism for this, but I love it, so I'm, I'm, I'm unafraid. I'm a big fan of the CBS show SEAL Team. Um, we have a good friend. I'm telling you, it's awesome. Uh, Military Times friend, Tyler Gray who is a producer and is uh, one of the actors on there. He's a former Delta guy. Uh, he's really good friends, particularly with our video team. He lives out in Hollywood, nice guy. Um, love that show. I think the tactics are good. Uh, you can tell that uh, they have very close attention to detail uh, from their military advisor advisors. They get very, very accurate on you know, their loadouts, their uniforms, the way they act. And Chris, also for you as someone who's a veteran, you know, I think they do a really good job of dealing with the, um, the issues that, you know, uh, special operators like that at that level uh, deal with both, you know, and how they deal with them, you know, uh, with some of the, the difficulties, emotional difficulties and, 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 and internal questions that they have to struggle with both within their unit and with their families and with the VA and all that kind of stuff. It's not heavy handed. That freaking drives me nuts when Hollywood like treats, you know, uh, veterans and, and people who are in the military as victims all the time. It's not like that, but it, it, it really, I think, uh, uh, strikes a balance. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is, you know, I like the show so much, I'm doing a fan blog. So every week on the day of the next episode, we'll be uh, releasing and posting uh, our fan blog. Um, I've got a great friend from the industry, uh, a, a woman who you'd never think it, but was a total fan of the show, who's going to be uh, helping me out with this and giving her opinions and thoughts about it. Um, and uh, and our, our top freelancer, Ian, is going to be writing up a, a, a synopsis of the show and that kind of stuff. So. I just want everyone to, to visit um, gearscout.militarytimes.com and find the, uh, the not a SEAL team uh, fan blog, is what we're calling it, uh, and, and, and check it out and, and get involved and leave some comments, and, and we'd love to hear your thoughts about it. But uh, that, that show is, uh, is entering a third season, and um, we're excited about that because you know they were on the chopping block and they, and they survived. And... Uh, they're going on great locations, and, and uh, their first episode was actually shot in Serbia and Belgrade. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a pretty cool show. And so check it out. Check out our fan blog um, and, you know, all the other great content on Gear Scout. And, and keep your eye out, too, for AUSA stuff and, 
and other content coming out from our visit up to SIG and Q. So until next week, Chris, thanks for All right. hanging out and talking tactical. And now uh, I got to watch the show. Yeah. And you, now you got to watch the show, operator. Right. I promise. All right. All right. Till next week, and I'll see you at the show. All right, buddy.